every time it rains, though only at night, a spiraling wooden staircase appears in my room. The sound of the rainfall against the roof is usually enough to rouse me from my sleep, the drumming against the glass loud and clear. The streetlight beyond the window casts a wash of shimmering orange light into my room through the gap in the curtains, and this light falls upon the staircase, extending up and through the ceiling into a world of shadow. The first time it happened, I just assumed that I was dreaming, and so I paid it no mind. I simply rolled over and returned to sleep, amused. The sun rose the next morning and cast the night away, and with it the stairs, and I promptly forgot all about them. That is until a few nights later when they appeared again, same spot as before, standing silently. I remember staring at it from my bed, trying to comprehend, trying to work out if what I was seeing was actually real. I glanced around the room and realized that the door to my bedroom had vanished, replaced entirely with a blank wall, and I ended up just watching the staircase, wide-eyed and terrified. Unsure how to proceed, and afraid that something might come down them, I think in the end I just screwed my eyes tight shut and forced myself back to sleep. This is what I did the third and fourth times too. I began to fear rain at night, because I knew what it meant. I started obsessing over weather reports. It was not until the staircase's sixth appearance that I found the courage to actually get out of bed and examine it a little closer. I know that there are some people out there who would have raced up that thing on day one, but I'm sorry, I'm just not one of them. I'm not the type of person who just acts. I have to think things through. Everything. I have to think everything through. I have to have all possible outcomes laid out of my head before I can commit to something, no matter how insignificant. I'll get a little confidence boost when I'm able to follow one of my pre-prepared routes all the way to the end, but it's exhausting. And sometimes, quite often in fact, something will happen that I hadn't prepared for. A conversation won't go the way that I had expected. A phone call fails to follow any of the possible paths that I had pre-planned. Or a social venture lands less than desirably, and I panic. I am reminded that life is chaotic and unfair, and I retreat back into myself a little further. I put things off because of this crippling, self-imposed setback. A pair of dumbbells sit unused and gathering dust in the corner of my room. My college assignments pile up. The university starts automatically knocking marks off your maximum potential grade for every day that you felt a hand in your assignment and passed the deadline. But for some reason, this still just isn't enough to motivate me. I hate myself and yet, I cannot find the will to work as hard as I would like. I stepped a little closer to the staircase. I tapped the edge of its rough and crooked carved banister with a finger as the rain washed down the window. Hard, cold, dark wood. I looked up. The steps of the stairs went round and round and disappeared up through a hole in the ceiling into a world of shadow. I imagined a terrible, twisted creature clamoring suddenly down on all fours eyes wide and jaw distended, screeching through the dark, and I saw myself trapped in a room with no door and no way out. Heart pounding, I returned hastily into my bed, and I pleaded for the night's swift passing and the rise of the sun. And sure enough, after a long and torturous night, it rose. My life continued to stagnate, the stairs always became less of a threat to my mind during the day, and I knew that I needed to visit the campus library to complete my work, but I could not summon the energy to do so. A few of my friends invited me out one evening, but I declined that too. 
My new lead topic of conversation would inevitably flow into our studies and our courses and things that we had been up to. And I just couldn't stomach another night of feeling inadequate and pathetic. So I made up some excuse and ignored all the subsequent messages. I was angry when I went to bed that night. Angry at myself and the world. And now I find myself being awakened once again by the beat of the rain on the roof. I grip my teeth in frustration and roll onto my side and sure enough, there they are. The stairs are there. And you know what? This time, I decide I'm going up. I've started keeping a baseball bat by the side of my bed and I grab it now as I clench my jaw and head on over to the stairs. I take a deep breath, squeeze the bat tight, and bring my foot down onto the first step. The wood is cold, but I feel at once a rush of warm air from up above. I lick my teeth and I continue my ascent. This is the night. This is the night that I found out what lies at the top, for better or for worse. I try to plan and play out a series of potential outcomes and routes in my head, though they all end up with me either running back down the stairs as fast as I can, or bashing something into submission with the bat in an adrenaline-fueled frenzy. Adrenaline kicks in, right? That's something that happens. But what if it doesn't? Are you strong enough to fight off whatever may come your way? I shoot a glance over at the dumbbells in the corner of my room, unused, and then over to the ashtray on my windowsill. My cough and reflex, and bristle with self-hatred. Forget it. I'm going up. And I do so. Step by step, I ascend, hands shaking as I rise up into the darkness. The sounds of the rain continue, but as I leave my room behind me, I can no longer hear it drum against the glass on my window. Instead, my ears suggest the rain now falls on foliage, leaves and ferns and forest. My eyes adjust quickly, quicker than one would expect, and I find myself surrounded, bizarrely, by jungle plant life. The air is suddenly thick with intense humidity, the smell of it strong and rich. I pause and look around. Strange, giant wildflowers quiver subtly in the breezeless wild. The buzzing and whirring of curious insects dance at the edge of my hearing, and I feel myself growing damp. Sweat buds across my skin and rain drips out of my neck and my shoulders through gaps in the wooden staircase above me. I strongly consider turning back. I'm way out of my depth here. This is just... This is insane. This is impossible. I'm not the man of action. I really, really haven't thought this through. I should return back to bed. Back to supposed safety. Like you always do, coward. I feel myself flush. No, not this time. This time I'm gonna keep going. I make my decision and I take the next step. And a noise echoes in the distance far above and away. I wait for it to happen again, but it does not. So I carry on cautiously up the stairs, the bat held high. The level of light around me becomes brighter, and to wash in green, I confirm without a doubt that I am stood in the midst of an enormous rainforest. Bright and foreign moss covers the banisters of the stairs, Vines hang down between the steps, and massive, vibrant flowers are in bloom all around, nestled amongst the dense undergrowth and brush of the jungle. Step after step, I climb, afraid but emboldened by my own commitment. The way up and ahead is blocked by huge, heavy leaves. I push through them and break above the canopy of the jungle, and then pause for a moment to catch my breath. My mouth falls open in shock as I do so. The stairs have ceased spiraling, and instead stretch out like a path ahead of me, tucked into the side of a lush green mountain, and rising at only a very steady incline. 
To my left, the tops of the trees fall away below, out and over an immense and forested valley, before eventually rising back up over more mountains in the far distance. The rain pelts steadily into the horizon, from gently churning blue-gray clouds, broken through here and there with rays of glittering light. I am overcome momentarily with a sudden sense of destabilization, of dizziness. My grimace and I put a hand to my throbbing temple as I weigh my options. Once again, I consider heading back. I wonder if the staircase might inexplicably vanish in the manner that it had appeared. If it would dissolve from beneath my feet, and I would tumble down through the trees and crash into the rough, wet earth below, trapped forever in this strange land. But the stairs never just disappear. They never vanish before my eyes. They simply cease to be once I've fallen asleep. They are gone by morning, but I've never been aware of a hugely specific time limit, so to speak. As long as I don't waste my time, as long as I stay awake, I should be okay. I'm rationalizing, I know it, trying to come up with excuses not to turn back. It's scary, but I've made a commitment. I want to see this through. If I go back down and the stairs and never reappear, then I'll never know, will I? I'll never know what's lay at the top, and I'll have to live with my choice for the rest of my life. So, I continue on along my way, and ahead in the distance, I hear that noise. The boards of the stairs turn to walkway creak beneath my feet. I hear around me the calls of strange birds and unknown creatures. I wipe the sweat from my forehead as I push through a row of sticky hanging vines. Thankful to be sheltered again from the rain by a new canopy of greenery overhead. A colorful frog jumps from the wet slick boardwalk and into the brush as I pass it by. The wooden walkway follows around the edge of the mountain and then turns to amble deeper into its jungle. I stop for a rest, stretching the muscles in my legs, my mouth uncomfortable and dry. I collect a small amount of trickling rainwater from the plants above in my hands and I drink it down. The cool liquid a welcome taste. But the sound of a creaking board of wood has me splutter at once in despair, and I swivel on the spot to look behind me, back the way I came. There's nothing there. Just the trickle of the rainwater through the leaves, and the shadows of the trees and ferns, shifting and shimmering ever so subtly. I hasten onwards, my pace slightly increased. I pass by towering trees, the trunks of which have been carved into terrifying shapes. Coiled snakes with heads like human skulls, strange apes snarling with wooden teeth, their arms ended in handless stumps crossed against their chest. Eyeless parrots, their wings poised and tensed as if ready to take flight. Stairs are made to be climbed, I mutter to myself over and over. They appeared for a reason. If this world wanted to harm me, they would have just sent something down into my room. I'm supposed to be here. I repeat this several times. I'm okay. I'm supposed to be here. I climb and climb, following along the railed wooden walkway, up some more steps, and I am faced at its eventual end with a wall of leaves and vines. This is it, I realize. The final opportunity to turn back. Last chance. But if I turn back now, then I will walk with guilt and shame and frustration. And if the stairs never reappear, then I will carry those feelings with me for the rest of my life. So I take a deep breath of hot, humid, rainforest air, and push through. The noise is loud, and reverberates through my surroundings as I make my way out onto the other side. I find myself standing at the edge of an enormous wooden temple. A small waterfall rumbles down the rock at the far side of the white hall 
and all around me are arches and flittering fireflies, glowing golden the green gloom. Looking up above the wooden arches, the walls of the temple extend high, high up into the sky with the trees, to the extent that I cannot see the top. And there's movement, all around, long, creaking, and ever-changing narrow wooden bridges grind from place to place. Carved gears turn as they splash water onto the bordered floor from up above, and wooden discs that must be at least half my height drop down through gaps. They roll through constantly shifting platforms and changing walls and barriers, and over and across the bridges as they are carried various routes around the temple. It's like nothing that I've ever seen. The clanking noise I now realize is the sound of the bridges suddenly moving, clattering with its adjacent gears as it directs the floor of the discs down a new path. Stay calm, Devin. I tell myself as I walk through the central hall, my footsteps heavy on the wet planks below. Stay calm. I make my way towards the little waterfall at the far side. I take in the unsettling carved wooden statues around the base of the pillars and the arches. And I realize they are all of me. I swallow, my mouth again dry. Some of the carved copies watch me pass in silence. Some of them have their heads in their hands. Some are turned to look over their shoulders, as if checking behind, back the way they came. None of the statues look happy. And there is one of these idols that differs from the rest. It becomes clear as I approach the waterfall, sat cross-legged between the two flowering vines in the form of a carved old man. Moss creeps up his sides and his chest. The wood is darkened with age and with water, and atop his neck is a head that is split into two faces, one facing to the left and one facing to the right. The face to the left has a beard that is carved to hang straight down, while the beard of the other is curled up and around his jaw. Neither face has any eyes, and the statue moves. Devin, says the faces together in a joint voice like the splitting of a log. I stagger back in alarm, crashing down onto the rain-soaked floor with a cry, barely aware of the pain throbbing in waves through my elbows as I stare in horror at the unnatural idol before me. I'm surprised to see you here, says the face with the curled beard, the face on the right. His head cracks around so that we are facing each other. An irregularity, to be sure. The head cracks round to the left, and the face with the pointed beard speaks in turn. Well, do you have anything to say? I stammer in disbelief, in shock, shaken on the ground as the bridges shift softly overhead. The left face sneers. You have always disgusted me, Devin. You are weak. If you have nothing to say, then be gone. I rise to a shaking stand and respond. I am not weak. A bridge on a lower level than the others grinds and shifts. I glance up to watch it connect to a new segment of wall, and a series of discs go rolling across it towards their new destination. The statue's head cracks to the right. Your first chosen words were a statement, in place of a question. I'm impressed, it says. Perhaps your little journey here has done something for your constitution. Perhaps, I reply cautiously, heart pounding. Perhaps you would like to tell me where my little journey has led me exactly. The mouth of the face on the right stretches into a grin, with the sound of a branch being torn from a tree. Clever, he says, avoiding another question, but you did so as a reaction, an act of deference to me. Think for yourself. I swallow. Well, I presumed you to be the power in this realm, I reply 
running a tongue over my dry lips. And it makes sense to follow the cues of the authority when in unfamiliar territory. Interesting, the face replies. I wonder how well your presumptions have carried you thus far. Its head cracks around to the left before I am able to respond. What is it that you want, boy? The face asks. Speak now and speak well, or I will cast you out. My grimace and take a slow, calming breath, holding back my fear. I cannot allow myself to break in front of this idol. I can't explain it, but I know that I just can't let that happen. What is this place, and why did you summon me here? The faces laugh together. Summon, the left replies. Such arrogance. You think I would bother to summon you here deliberately? An agentless worm such as yourself, one with a will free and name only, withered and saddened beyond recognition. The face snaps around to the right. If I had summoned you here, Devon, you would have not come. Decision making is not a strength of yours. You avoid. I stand tall, defiant. But I did. I did come, didn't I? Or do I not stand before you in this very moment? A bridge pulls out from the wall and slides around at a right angle directly above the statue's head. And a collection of discs rolled out along the new path and into the opposite wall above. You haven't answered my question, I tell them. A pause, and then... You stand in the Temple of Prowess, your Temple of Prowess, to be quite specific, says the face on the right. Probability and chance and choice are all weighed here together, and the outcomes play through down below. The columns in the Great Walls represent varying aspects of your being. I don't understand. I reply, glancing up at the subtly shifting wooden walls nestled amongst the rainforest canopy above. Of course you don't understand, says the face on the left as the head cracks round. You barely exist at all. It surprises me not that your mind is as dulled as your potential for displacement. What ripples do you create in the water, boy? The statue speaks in riddles. I feel like I can only grasp the gist of what it is saying. I gesture to a column up to my left, narrow yet deep, filled with an array of platforms stacked full to the brim with wooden discs. It extends high up into the trees. And what does that one represent? The head cracks round to the right. The column there in this branch of your temple shows to me a critical component in the matrix of your health. It shows to me the likelihood of one of your cells mutating into a poison, a cancer of the flesh, within the next seven cycles of the moon. I stare up at the column in horror. Cancer? Multiple bridges suddenly shift and swivel out from these sides of the column, extending out to meet bridges on the other side of the hall. A cascade of discs fall from the newly shifting platforms, and they roll out and across these bridges to their new destinations. What the? What just happened? I asked the statue. Why is the column changing? You gave up smoking. It replies simply. What? What do you mean? How could I have just given up smoking? How could you know that? Four questions in one. The face to the right replies sadly and his head cracks around to the left. It is the truth. A decision was made. Former outcomes have sealed themselves off and new outcomes have opened. Is this how you wish to spend your time here? As a gaping fish blubbering over the simplest of concepts. And what if I change my mind? My retort bristling with existential fear. Just to spite you, let's say I smoke a dozen cigarettes upon my return to my room. The angle of the bridges above me changed slightly, enough to slow the descent of the discs. 
they creak and groan and drab. Then that will be an exercise of will, the face replies. And Janice knows you need it. I stare up at the creaking bridges for a moment in thought, and then watch as they return to their angles, and the discs continue their descent to their new locations, rolling noisily through the temple. Holy crap. The implications. The implications of a place such as this. I am unable to keep myself from playing my entire life out through my head, weighing on all my past choices and decisions, mistakes and triumphs, few as they are, all swirling, crashing and melting against and into each other. The statue rises to his feet. The motion is horrific. I had only just gotten used to its faces and now it stands as an ancient, wooden monstrosity. And I can feel a sensation of a sickening vertigo twist and tilt my now fragile hold on reality. Get a hold of yourself, boy. The face on the left shouts at me, as bridges begin to shift with rapidity, shaking the foundations of the temple as they do so. You don't belong here, says the face on the right. Return to your life. Go on as you were. Allow me to return to my peace. How much have I missed? I choke out. How many outcomes have I closed off? How many for good? The statue clenches its fist as splinters rain down around us. The ground shakes. You wait for a coming change. A great fix, says the face on the right, its tone deep and solemn. You wait and you wait for external forces to push you in one direction or another. The head cracks round to the left. But you fail to see that there will be no great change. The external forces rush by like a wind over the rocks as the cells of your life and your energy mutate, one by one. The head shifts and both voices speak together. Nothing will come of nothing. The ground shakes. Get him out! The voices roar, and I spin to see my copies. The statues of myself around the temple stagger awkwardly from their podiums, stumbling towards me with viciousness, arms outstretched. No! No! I shout. I can't allow these things to control me. I am the master of my own destiny. I have to be. And I hold the bat up high and tensed in shaking hands. And I bring it round in a wide arc, smashing it into the side of the closest copy's head with a deep and echoing crack. One which splinters the wood and sends the statue reel into the floor with a series of loud thuds. I heave the bat up high and bring it down as hard as I can onto the splintered head. It shatters in a shower of brown and green. I bring the bat round again. I swivel and smack it with grunts of deliberate force into statue after statue, sending them all sprawling to the ground. I back away as I do, retreating to the temple's entrance and the gate of vines. I hold the bat up high and call out to the idol of the two-faced man. I'm going alright, I'm going, but on my terms, not on yours. The decision is mine, and mine alone. The statue opens both his mouths, makes to speak again, but I choose not to stay and listen. Instead, I turn and run from the approaching statues, sprinting back across the boardwalk through the forest and the rain. My slip and I stumble, but I do not slow. Lightning crackles through the sky in the distance, but I pay it no mind. I hurtle back down along the wooden path and around the edge of the mountainside and I can feel the wood beneath me start to creak. I put my hand on a rail for support and it breaks clean off, falling down into the jungle below. Oh no, am I too late? Was I gone too long? The creaks grow into a series of cracks, a loud rotting tearing. The wood gives way. The planks beneath my feet start to break off and fall through the leaves. Please... I mutter, and then louder. Please, just a little longer. A little bit longer. 
I can see the top of the spiraling staircase. I'm so close, but not close enough. Just as I grab the rail, the entire apparatus collapses. It falls with the rain down through the twisted trees and leaves. I try to grab a hold of something, of anything, but it's too wet. I can't get a grip. The vines, they aren't slowing me enough. I can't keep my grip. This is the end. I squeeze my eyes tight shut in panic, calling out for help, for something, for anything. And the air that rushes past my face suddenly cools. The humidity is left in a cloud behind me, and I slam down hard, and land on the carpet to my room, sending an almighty shudder through the floor and the walls. Oh God, I groan. Oh Christ. A moment later, my room door is thrown open. Two of my housemates stand in shock, clearly just roused from sleep. Man, they stare at me as I lay soaked through and bruised amidst a pile of rotted wood. What the heck, Devin? Hey, are you okay, man? What in the world was that? I stare at them in confusion for a second or two, gathering my bearings and then I wince as I turn to look behind me. The stairs are gone. The sun has begun its rise, and the rain is letting up. It patters gently against the glass of my window. And I laugh. I stagger to my feet, kicking away the wood, and nearly falling if not for my housemates jumping forward to help me balance. I thank them and stumble to my chest of drawers, throwing a change of clothes into my college bag. Devin, they ask me as I hastily pull on my shoes. What are you doing? Where the heck are you going? It's five in the morning. I clench my jaw and massage my wrist, before hoisting the bag onto my back and pushing past them towards the front door. You know what? I reply with a wave. I'm going to go to the frickin' library. And then, I think to the gym.